All right, thanks everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Thursday afternoon uh, seminar this week. Um, welcome to those of you in person and those of you joining us online. Hopefully the Zoom works because we're having to jerry rig it a little bit because we're not in our main lecture theatre. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands on which we meet, Littoral Reader, Tasmania, Aboriginal land, sea and waterways, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to welcome any members of the audience who recognise or um, identify as being a member of the First Nations community joining us today. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bill Connolly. Um, I'm doing this with my School of Medicine hat on. Um, Bill is an academic staff member in the School of Medicine, joined around four years ago, I believe. Um, Bill has a, a long academic history working in the field of neuroscience, did his PhD at the University of Otago before doing a postdoctoral stint in both Cardiff and at ANU before joining us at the University of Tasmania in a range of areas from um, neuron synaptic physiology, more recently to, I suppose, data-based or theoretical neuroscience. And I think that's what Bill's going to talk to us um, today. And I'm really excited to hear about how machine learning, deep, machine learning, deep learning and AI can help me and my research. So thanks, Bill, over to you. No problem. So yeah, this is, this is sort of going to be kind of like a didactic kind of educational talk rather than me trying to say how amazing the science that I do is. Because um, I think that machine learning is every day impacting us more and more. And maybe you haven't felt it yet, but you probably have. You didn't even know it as in the recommendations you get from Netflix, what pops up next on your Facebook feed, so in your car, you know, it, 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 it's, it's coming whether you like it or not. And so having some understanding about it, I think is a sort of a societally important thing, but also for doing science, it can be really useful. Um, and, and so because I want to sort of educate, I need to start at some level and I'm going to start at the beginning, right? So if you have like an opinion on the difference between PyTorch and TensorFlow, this is not the talk for you. I thoroughly recommend that you leave um, in part because, you know, you might spot the mistake I make, but no, um, it, 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 it's, it's, we're going to start simple, right? And we're going to go through, we're going to say, what is machine learning? We're going to talk about sort of the two major classes of machine learning, supervised and unsupervised learning. Then we're going to talk about neural networks, which will lead us to deep learning and AI. And then finally, we're going to talk about what it could do for you as a scientist in this building. And sort of machine learning is kind of, well, I suppose like a lot of definitions, it's got kind of an annoying definition, the kind of definition that, well, it says the algorithms that are able to learn and adapt without following explicit instructions. And this is the kind of definition that if you understand what machine learning is, you understand this definition. But if you don't know what that means, that doesn't help you, right? And I hate these kind of definitions. And also because it's not true, right? It runs on a computer. It follows explicit instructions. That's all it can do, right? It's what those ex explicit instructions allow it to do that are interesting and what they allow it to do is learn things about your data. Uh, and I would say that in general, the best way to learn about things is to look at examples. So the, the simplest form of machine learning, and it truly is a form of machine learning, is linear regression. And so most people should be sort of vaguely too completely familiar with what linear regression is, right? You, you take some input, we've got weight here, you um, have some, some output or some other value, height, you fit a line to it, you know, and in most people here, what you're really interested in when you do this is, is there some kind of relationship between height and weight? And if P is less than 0 0.05, you say there is, and you move on with your life. What does this have to do with learning, right? But the point is that line, that line of best fit is the learning, okay? What the computer has learned to do is it has learned to predict the height from the weight. And it's learned to do that because it's got some little rule in its head and that rule is this least squares right it's saying to itself i've done the best job of fitting this line when i've achieved this criterion i've minimized the difference between the the true value y and our prediction y hat right um and of course the point here is that now i could use that best fit line i could give a new weight and i could predict a new height one that the computer's never seen before so it's learned something now how did it learn that well in the case of linear regression, there's kind of a mathematical shortcut, this disgusting looking beast, right? If you've done linear algebra, you know what this means. If you haven't, you don't, and you don't need to, right? The point is that there's just some maths you can do that will give you the answer, that will give you what is the slope and the intercept of that line, all right? And that's what that maths looks like, okay? And so linear regression falls under the category of supervised learning, right? So supervised learning is a whole set of algorithms where the 
computer is given a training data set where each example in that training data set is a matched pair, some input that is matched with some output, which is usually like some predictors and, and some true value, right? Which we saw before was the, the weight was the predictor and the true value was the height. Um, but they're always in these pairs, right? Where there's a true value, a known true value. And of course, in the, in the case of linear regression, we're trying to predict some continuous output, but in supervised learning, we can predict more complicated things. So we could take a photograph and we could get the computer to look at that photograph and predict that's a cat, all right? So, and that cat, that, 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 cat, that label, that's part of this training data set. We're going to show up millions of photos of cats and dogs, and we're going to say, that's a cat, that's a dog, that's a cat, that's a dog. And the computer is going to learn to make that prediction. It doesn't need to be photos, right? It could be text, it could be natural language, right? So it could be a review, a review of a shop, and we could, our training, our, our data set, our matching pair of data could be that text review and the stars. Was it a one star? Was it a five star review? And so the computer could learn to predict the star value from the text. It could be anything, right? So what I've got here is it could be the, the um, surface temperature, the surface pressure, the wind speed and the wind, wind direction for the whole planet. And what it's trying to predict is the weather in three days time on any particular spot. All right. So, so there's sort of, in, in a lot of ways, there's kind of no limit to what the data can be. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, is kind of the same thing, but without that true value, right? So it's just a collection of data with no labels associated. And the, the, the computer then follows some rule that it knows to in some way make sense of the data, right? And because it's just a diverse set of tools that don't kind of neatly fit together often, there's no simple way I can tell you what makes sense of it means. It depends on the algorithm. But typically these approaches fall into either clustering algorithms or dimensionality reduction, which is to say, let's say our data set was just a collection of XY data points. Right. Um, now, what I want you to imagine is it's not XY data points, it's highly multi-dimensional data. You know, it's the it's RNA seq from a bunch of cells, and we have the transcript, we have a thousand different transcripts we're measuring, right? But let's just imagine it as 2D data, and we think there might be some separate populations in there, and we just feed that data into the computer with no label, and it says uh, you've got you've got five different clusters, and these are where they are, okay. And often when you have that very that high dimensional data, the data where each data point is actually represented by a thousand numbers, you can't even look at it properly. You can't even make sense of it. Like you don't even know what you've got when you've got it. So often you want to view it reduced down to 2D. So this is UMAP, which is the close cousin of TSNI, which I'm sure lots of people are sort of vaguely familiar with, right? And this is RNA-seq data from a whole bunch of cells. You know, so it's a thousand transcripts from 10,000 cells and you just feed that data in and outcome for every thousand dimensional data point, outcome two numbers and you put them on a graph and you get pretty pictures like this and somebody thinks it means something and maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, right? But you can see that when the, these were being subsequently labeled by what they were, you can see all the neurons ended up in one place, all the astrocytes ended up another and that looks pretty cool and looks good and yeah, you know, I'm going to submit this to nature kind of um, paper. So we have these sort of two cl classes, supervised learning, where there's some true label, um, which, you know, in your head, you should sort of loosely think in sort of a regression-y kind of thing. And so, yeah, linear regression, old school, it's, it's still supervised learning and linear discriminant analysis. So that's another supervised learning technique into more modern things like support vector machines and neural networks, which is what I'm actually going to dive into. On the other hand, there is unsupervised learning where we get no label. It's just the, just the data goes in. And so hierarchical clustering and principal component analysis, if you're familiar with those, those are unsupervised learning techniques. And then um, we go to things like these manifold learning techniques like TSNI, like UMAP, and a whole collection more that are sort of as fundamentally dimensionality reduction uh, techniques. And I might say this is not sort of an exhaustive, um, well, I suppose everything is either a cat or not a cat. And so everything is either supervised or unsupervised, but there's a whole section in the middle um, where of things like the called like semi-supervised learning, self-supervised learning, where I think, um, this is where there's going to be massive explosion in research, and I don't super have time to get into it, but, but self-supervised learning is 
pretty cool. And as I say, I think that's where a lot of stuff is going to happen. And in that, it's basically that the computer should be able to infer some kind of label from the data. So the example I like to think of is we have video data of like a bird flying by with on a still background, right? The computer should be able to figure out, look, the background is the background because it never changes. And this thing, this bird, while from every single frame to every next frame, it's shifted a little bit and its wings look different. That must be one thing, right? And so from that simple rule of like things that don't change a kind of background and things that change but only shift a little bit from frame to frame must be the same thing. The computer could infer a lot, even though we never went through every single frame and went, this is the background, here's the bird. This is the background, here's the bird. So, so there's a lot that could be done there. And of course, it's kind of interesting to me because but that's kind of how we learn, right? Sure, you, the, eventually you tell the one-year-old, that's called a cat, that's a cat. But the kid already knew that this was a thing. It walked around, you know, it didn't get confused when the cat turned around and showed it its left side. It's like, I don't know what that thing is. I've never seen it walking that way before, right? Because it's done that, that self-supervised learning. All right, so neural networks, that's what I'm going to talk about. That's what I'm sort of primarily interested in is what I use a lot and that's what is sort of behind most of these learning techniques that impact you whether you know it or not all right and we've got to start with linear regression so hopefully we know you know linear regression is this technique where we predict some output some y from from an, a vector of x values a collection of different x values and we we basically multiply each one by a coefficient these betas right and we just sum them all up and that's our output, right? So if we're trying to predict, you know, how big a tumor is going to grow, we might have a thousand um, transcript amounts, right? And we might say, well, it's the volume is going to be 0.1 times this transcript plus 0.2 times that transcript plus minus 0.5 times that transcript, and that's our that's our linear regression. Okay. Now um, we might instead of wanting to predict the size of the tumor, we might want to say, what's the likelihood that someone's going to develop cancer? So we don't like our linear regression because it can predict positive infinity and negative infinity, and that doesn't make sense in that context of probability. So let's do a logistic regression, right? So we start off with kind of the same thing. We have eta equals beta zero plus beta one times x one plus beta two times x two, and we do that same sum, but then we put that sum into this transfer function, or I'm going to call it transfer function, what, what, what the logistic function, right? The sigmoid that, that you see, right? And what that does is it just bounds the outputs between zero and one, right? And hopefully this is not too shockingly intimidating to you at this point, right? Point is, we've just gotten some inputs, we've multiplied each input by a coefficient, we've summed the result up, and then we just chuck that into a function to get some output, all right? So that's logistic regression. And if logistic regression mathematically could be shown like that, then graphically it could be shown like this, right? So we have these laser pointer go. Um, we have these, these are our inputs. We have one in our first input because one times beta zero is beta zero. So that gives us that. And then we have x1, beta one, x2, beta two, x3, beta. we sum them all up and then we whack them into this logistic function, our transfer function, we get an output. Right. So if this is logistic regression shown graphically, then a neural network is simply that. Now, simply, oh God, well, the arrow is everywhere, right? But the point is, this is just doing a logistic regression on these inputs. That is doing a logistic regression on these inputs, but with different, a different set of coefficients. And that one is doing it as well. And then we generate our outputs, just a number, just a number, you know, somewhere between zero and one. And then that is fed into this one, which of course has another set of coefficients. And then we produce some output. In this case, it's one number. If we wanted to predict two numbers, we have a second node here that would have a different set of coefficients, and we would now be generating two numbers. Okay. Um, now that sort of neural networks broke in a little ball, right? Um, it does get more complicated than that, right? There are all sorts of architectures, which is to say, who's connected to who. Um, but they all still follow that basic rule that you have, that each neuron, each little logistic regression node, each little circle, gets some inputs, multiplies them by a coefficient, sums them up, puts them through some nonlinear function, right? And then all you do is you just have these layers where this is the input layer, so these, these neurons just take on the value of the input. Then you have some hidden layer, which is any layer that is not the output, and any subsequent layer can only see the layer before it. 
And of course, this is supposed to be reminiscent of the of neurons in the brain. You have some region that talks to some other region. These are neurons that get synaptic input, which can be excitatory or, or inhibitory, i.e. the coefficients can be positive or negative, and then they produce some output that's some function of that. So that's just the input-output curve of a neuron. Um, so what does this have to do with learning, right? <laughs> now, this is where it sort of it gets a bit dark and people get upset when they're trying to learn about it because it sort of involves a little bit of calculus, but I'm going to try and remove the calculus. And, and go through it kind of, no, we don't want that yet, um, like this, right? So when the, we've made our network, right? Which is just these logistic regressions all wired up together. And we just have some input. Let's just say it's a photo of a cat. We bung in the photo of the cat. I'm going to talk about what that means in a second, right? And we get some output and it's just gibberish, all right? What we need is some way of deciding is that prediction good or bad? And that is this cost function. This is that, that that um, least squares function we saw in the regression. Now, it doesn't need to be least squares. There are other cost functions that suit other things, but it's always some metric of distance. How good was the prediction? Was the prediction close to the true value or was it far away? And if it's close, then the cost is low. And if it's far away, the cost is bad. And that cost is just a function of the inputs and the coefficients. So, this is the calculus, but what we can do is we can take the derivative of that cost function with respect to the inputs. What that just means, right, is that it tells us how we can change the inputs to make the cost smaller, right? And so that's what we do. We tweak the inputs, the betas, so that we go downhill in this cost function, right? So we make the cost less. So we change the coefficients a little bit and we know how to change them because we've calculated this derivative. And um, we just change it a little bit, and now that prediction will be slightly better. Okay, and then we look at another example. It's a different photo of a cat. Maybe it's a dog this time, and uh, it would make some prediction, and you go, oh, "That was a terrible prediction." This is how you need to change your weights a little bit to um, make a better prediction. And then once you've changed those weights in one layer, you can now follow a similar logic to change the weights in the layer before that, in the layer before that. And that's why it's called backpropagation, not to be confused with backpropagation in real neurons, right? This is what happens between the layers where this error, this cost is propagated backwards. So each layer learns and it just update its weights a little bit. And if you do it enough, eventually the network might be able to form a very good prediction. Okay, so if that's neural networks, what is deep learning, right? Deep learning is just the same thing with more layers, right? This one has three hidden layers, right? And they're hidden solely because there's nothing really hidden about them. They're just hidden because they are not set as the input, you know, the values that you're putting into the network, and they're not looked at in terms of the output. And you you just, you don't, you don't, sort of you as the person doing it, you don't touch them, the computer takes care of them. But you can open them up and look at them if you want. Um, and yeah, so deep learning is just lots of layers. Now I've got three here. You might have 50, you might have 100. You're not going to have a million as things exist currently, but you have lots, okay? Um, and basically that allows the network to do more complicated things. At this point, it's also worth thinking about, um, especially if you sort of have some statistical background, you know that complicated models are kind of bad, right? And this might sound like we're entering into complicated models territory. And you're damn right we are, right? So if each one of these neurons, let's say we have 100 neurons here, and each one is, gets 100 inputs, then that layer alone has 10,000 coefficients, right? So this would be linear regression hell. Um, and because I'm not a statistician officially, I don't have to worry about that, right? All I care about is does the prediction work. That's not quite true, but fundamentally that's true. Okay, so then what is artificial intelligence, right? So we've gone, we've gone from machine learning to neural networks to deep neural networks. What is artificial intelligence, right? So I used to try and fight the good fight. So artificial intelligence has kind of nothing to do with this, right? Artificial intelligence means the textbook definition is just any algorithm that takes some input and processes it, processes it to achieve some goal. So the, the, the badly behaved door in the front of this building that's artificial intelligence, right? It's bad artificial intelligence, but it still counts as artificial intelligence. Um, and I, I'm true in what I'm saying, right? And every time someone did some machine learning and was like, I'm doing artificial intelligence, intelligence I'd be like, you are, but it's not very educational. But too many people who actually 
published important papers on this have stopped and just it's all artificial intelligence so i'm lost all right you can call whatever you want artificial intelligence i don't care anymore so okay so let's get back to the nitty-gritty right how does this actually work how do we get our inputs right and, and it just depends on what your inputs are what is your research problem so you know machine learning of this kind of neural networks really took off when it was shown that they are really really good at processing images all right you know there's a there's a famous XKCD comic about how incredibly difficult it is to predict, to say what type of bird is in a photo of a bird, right? Um, it's not hard anymore. It's trivial. I could do it in an afternoon, okay? And it works because images are actually just collections of numbers, right? So uh, this is a grayscale image of a hand-drawn number nine. Each pixel is a zero, a white pixel is a one, and gray is somewhere in between. And so historically what we would have done we probably won't do this anymore is we just collect that um, image we'd split all of the rows for one big column vector of 784 pixel values because it's 28 by 28 and that would be our input layer right for one in one example and in the next example we would just have the um another hand drawn number right each one 28 by 28 and we would just run through and try and predict is that a one or two or three or four or five six seven eight or nine or a zero and we'd perform the back propagation and hopefully the network would get good at it natural language is kind of a tricky one right natural language in some ways we're really good at dealing with it in some ways we're terrible at dealing with it and depending on who you talk to people will tell you different things but the point is that the input, a, a word, doesn't naturally lend itself. And by this, I mean textual language, textual, textual, natural language doesn't, doesn't lend itself because it's not a number, right? It doesn't have a numeric value. So what you have to do is you have to convert it to some kind of numeric value. And you do this by a process called embedding, right? This is another word that's thrown around by machine learners. If you've ever heard of or or, or used a T-SNE, the, the E in T-SNE is embedding, right? Embedding is just the process of taking some input and converting it via some way, shape, or process to a set of numbers. It could be setting a set of one numbers to another set of numbers, or in this case, it's taking a word and converting it to a set of numbers. Now, this is just like a cartoon version. But the point of an embedding of text is to make, make it so that um, semantically similar words end up with similar numbers. So here we have toilet, that's a word, right? It ends up being given the, the coordinates 0.4 and zero, while faucet, this is obviously American, gets 0.4 and just less than zero, right? So they're semantically similar, they end up with numbers that are similar. While here we have garden and hose end up with 0.3 and 0.5 pretty much, right? So. We do this embedding because it basically informs the network everything about language semantics before it's even begun to try and do the complicated process of what, the, what does this collection of words mean, okay? Um, now, as I say, this is a cartoon. In reality, most embedding to make it work needs to, you need about 100 numbers to represent a word. Um, if you pare it down from that, you basically lose the definition of the word. Um, but uh, yeah, the concept remains, okay? And so the, the, these are just two examples, but they show that in order to put your data, whatever your data is, into a machine learning um, algorithm, you need to convert it to numbers. Each input could be one number. It could be a collection of numbers, a vector. It could be a matrix, a square of numbers, like an image. It could be a tensor, you know, a cube or bigger of numbers. There's got to be numbers. Okay, that's not me. Um, and as I say, it's best if similar inputs whatever similar means in your field, produce similar numbers. And so what can we do? Well, we can categorize images, right? This is what neural networks has been the best at for a really long time. This is just some work that a student, uh, just a, a, um, like a summer student did in my lab last year, which is we take photos of um, skin lesions, right? That experts have already labeled for us. So this is gonna be um, supervised learning. We, we, we then feed in these photos, Right, and the network learns to make a prediction. So the output layer has seven um, neurons in it, and each of these neurons represented one of the categories. And so, for instance, we feed this one in, 
what we want is that third node to generate a very large value and all of the rest to generate small values. And then we say this is a null node. And it was able to do this at about 90% accuracy, which is about as good as you can do. Um, and also starts to bring up the whole question of data quality, right? How, I just got this as this is what the experts think. But did the experts ever disagree, right? And so there's a whole other field of trying to deal with uncertainty in these uh, in these models, which they sort of, they're good at being reporting the model's uncertainty, but they're not so good at dealing with their inputs uncertainty. They like it if they're certain about their inputs. We could do um, image segmentation. So this is another summer studentship um, work where the student had this ad hoc um, uh, footage of a mouse uh, and here's its eye and basically we needed to know was the mouse attending to a visual stimuli so we were able to extract both the pupil size its position and the eyelids uh, and from that we could also generate like a 3d predict prediction of where the mouse was actually looking in space um, and again there were like traditional algorithms that performed this task as well um, but they struggled because all of these footage had the whiskers in the way, and that confused the methods out of them. So we had to go to um, sentiment analysis. So I feel like sentiment analysis could be something that could be quite useful to people in this building, right? You take a survey, you end up with 10,000 responses, you jump up and down, you think you've done well, and now you realize you've got, you know, each response is 400 words each. You've got a lot of words to read. So this is just a collection of labeled tweets. Uh, where we are saying this is a positive tweet, uh, this is a negative tweet, you know, and, and again, these, the behavior of this network that can predict whether a tweet is sort of loosely positive or negative depends on the training data and our annual goals, right? This is sort of one of the point of, of this whole thing is that there always, there is this room to achieve your specific goals. I.e., if you walk out of this thinking that neural networks are, fan are just fancy regression, I'm going to be happy with that. But the point is they have this massive flexibility that you cannot get in uh, regression. And so this is a kind of example of that. So smart dimension dimensionality reduction, right? So here's these hand-drawn numbers again, these 28 by 28 um, numbers, and we use them just because they're a really nice, well-behaved data set to, to use with. But I want you to imagine them instead as being something like RNA-seq data, right? So you've got 768 transcripts that you know the, the, the amount of, um, and uh, you kind of have no idea what's going on. You know, does this represent a single patient group in there, patient subgroups, uh, you know? How am I going to do this? And you could do this sort of a classical kind of, you know, generate your volcano plot, right? And uh, I'm not, not going to have a statistical debate about that right now, right? But my, before you even do that, you might just want to know, look, is this just kind of one hom homogeneous population or is there lots going on? And so what you could do is run a PCA, right? And a PCA is on this data, on these numeric, these hand-drawn numerals is going to look like this, right? And the reason I'm using these hand-drawn numerals is because we know there's really 10 groups in here, right? We know that that's the case, right? And, but you can imagine, even if I gave this to you as a just a column vector of, num of numbers, i.e. each one being the brightness of each pixel, you would probably never figure this out, right? Uh, maybe you're smarter than me, but if someone was like, I've got this interesting data, here's this, I'd go, I don't know, <laughs> what's going on, right? But we know because we made up this numeral system, there's 10, there should be 10 clusters in there. Here's the PCA, that's a little bit body like that. Let's make it a little transparent. And so you can see there is some structure going on here, right? There's something here, there's something here. I don't know if I saw that PCA, I'd be like, oh, I don't know, probably four groups, maybe one, two, three, four, five. I don't know, you know, this, this, <laughs> I'd be very upset if I got this data, right? Um, but again, we know there should be 10 groups, all right? And the reason is because the PCA has its rules that it follows, and it's looking for dimensions, single dimensions of maximal variance, right? And then making linear combinations of those. And kind of, we don't care about dimensions of maximal variance. That's not, we, we, what are we, I mean, this is often the problem. What do we care about? I, not even really sure I know right at this point um here you can see here's the true the true labels you can say yeah we get a nice I think that's the one off to the side um but you know huge overlap okay so what we can instead use is a network architecture called an autoencoder strictly speaking we're now in the land of unsupervised learning because we don't care about labels right now um 
And basically what we do is we put our number in here, you know, again, we've stretched it out into our column uh, of, 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 of pixel values. And then we pass it through a network that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller until we get some little bottleneck, which might be three neurons. Now, what does that mean? That means that um, our, our input, which is truly just one number, conceptually it's one number, but is actually made up of 768 pixel values, is now being represented only by three numbers. And then what the network is required to do is from those three numbers, build back up a complicated representation. And the point is we are asking the network to make sure that this and this are identical so that it can reproduce the same image it started with. And in order to do that, all of the important relevant information must be contained in here. And so this is what happens, right? And this is where I've made this network only have two nodes in the middle, right? So that whole 768 numbers that represent each numeral uh, boil down to just two numbers. And then from those two numbers, we reconstruct. And has it done a perfect job? No, right? The five, it's, it, it thought this five was a six. You can kind of uh, maybe not blame it. There's nine, this four did into a nine, but by and large, it's done a pretty good job. It's also worth pointing out, right, that it doesn't just remember this is the number nine and then reproduce an archetypal nine or whatever, because you can see that the two sixes it tried to reproduce are different. Okay, so it's really trying its best to reproduce the original thing itself, but it has to go through that bottleneck. So if we plot the bottleneck, this is what we end up with, right? So each, um, these are the zeros, they ended up over here, you know, one, now, it's still some overlap, right? Don't get me wrong, right? But the point is, it's very clear that there is much more structure in this data, and we can see that there must be at least, you know, I've color-coded it here, so it's kind of cheating, but there must at least be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, different clusters in here. And of course, this was just done in a kind of quick and dirty fashion. And if we had a real understanding of what our data was, we could probably do a smarter reconstruction and come up with even uh, better clarity. Whoa, wrong button. Okay. So what else can we do? Well, you know, I'm a neuroscientist at heart and I, one of the reasons I'm really interested in neural networks is because they share features with the real brain. They're not exactly the same, is it? They've got quite a few differences, right? But they were designed to be similar to the brain. And, you know, each neuron in your artificial neural network receives a whole bunch of inputs like synapses, and those synapses can either make the neuron produce a bigger output or a smaller output, again, like excited or inhibitory synapses. So we've got this, this behavior that's vaguely brain-like, and let's sort of think about a particular theoretical problem, which is, you know, if I get my four-year-old um, and I teach her to play T-ball, okay, and we spend six months playing T-ball, and then we spend six months um, learning to play golf, um, and then I go back and I say, all right, let's do T-ball again. Maybe she would be quite as good as that last day of the six months of T-ball breaks, but she won't be like, oh, I'll put the T-ball in front of her and be like, oh, that didn't work, right? The, 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 there is no... Um, catastrophic forgetting, as it's called, right? That one memory doesn't overwrite a previous memory, that they can exist at the same time. But we've known for ages that artificial neural networks tend to undergo catastrophic forgetting. You train neural networks to do one task, it's killing it, it's awesome at it, right? And then you show it one new example from another task and it just can't do the previous task before. And, I, and I, I'll show you, right? So here we have two data sets, my lovely favorite hand-drawn numbers, but we also have this fashion data set where we have 10 different types of articles of clothing, right? And, and so what we do is we start with our neural network, we begin to train it to predict the numbers, all right? And you can see it gets pretty good at it after it's looked at about 4,000 examples. And the, the color's not really coming through, but now I ask it to start to learn this fashion classification problem. And the instant I do, I show it one example, and now it's only 50% accurate at doing the numbers, and it's still not even that good at predicting the fashion item. And after a few more trials, you know, it's doing okay at the fashion, end, but it's doing monstrously terribly at predicting the new numbers, okay? So this is catastrophic forgetting or catastrophic interference. The, 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 old, the new task overwrites the old task. You know, why would that happen? Um, well, uh, so my hypothesis is basically the network is at its information capacity limit. All right, it's 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 full up 
dealing with this task and it basically has no spare resources to move anything out. So if that's true, if I make the room bigger, it should perform much better. And that's exactly what happens here. So I, in the dark red, I've now made the network 10 times larger. It's got 10 times as many neurons in it. Uh, you can see it learns. It gets to basically about the same performance, fractionally better. And then I start training it on the fashion network. And you can see that it starts to get very good at the fashion, but it's still good at the numeral classification. Now, yes, if I keep training, at on fashion, you can see that the performance in the in the um, in the the numeral classification gets pretty bad. But there's a period of time where it's good at both of them. Okay, and what would I could have done is I could have swapped between, train a little bit on the fashion, train a little bit on the number, and we'd be away and could do both of them at the same time. All right. So so in my hypothesis, but as to why this is possible, is because it's basically learned a distributed representation, which is to say that not every neuron is necessary. Uh, to perform the task, right? It's sort of got fail safes in there. It's got redundant um, information processes. So if that's true, right? If I can take our ten times um, our ten times larger network and force it to learn as fast representation, which is to say that learn it but with as few neurons as possible, um, I, it should now undergo catastrophic forget it. And that's fundamentally what happens, right? So in these light colors, now I'm trying to, I've changed the cost function to enforce that sparse representation. And we get back to the same problem. At the moment, I show one training example for the fashion, it drops down to 50%, okay? So that's the kind of thing, right? This was just like me over a couple of days, thinking of something fun I could do for this talk, but we can use it to look at real neural behavior. And of course, this is not proving that this is why it happens in the brain. It's just an idea, right? Now, problems. Okay, so supervised learning is all well and good, but it often requires very large data sets and labeled data sets, right? So it's not enough to go into Google Images and download 100 million images and think you've got a training set here, because you've got to go through and say, that one's a cat, and that one's a dog, and that one's this, and that's very labor intensive. There are tricks, right? Uh -oh, we can maybe get away with a thousand in certain cases maybe even a bit less than that, right? But, but we want to be getting as, as many things as possible. The other problem, and this is a sort of a more serious societal level one, is that the, the, the point, the, the, what I've told you about how neural networks work is that they basically learn to predict the data that they're trained on. So if the data they're trained on is busted, they will just reproduce it. And so this is most painfully brought out by various American jurisdictions who have thought our law and order system is falling apart. Let's leverage some machine learning to try and help us. Maybe we should use it to recommend sentences. And of course, the racism inherent in the American judicial system means that the machine learning algorithms looked at African-Americans and decided that they should be sentenced to longer than white people for the identical crime, right? I mean, why in the how would you leave the race into the training data? But this is the kind of stuff that maybe society needs to go through. And so you can see the problem, right? Um, and, and again, this is where I think machine learning is great for us in this building, right? But when um, it comes to life and death decisions, we need to take things a bit more slowly and a bit more carefully and pay maybe a few more people have you know, you know, the old Jurassic Park, they, they didn't think to, you know, if they should, well, there should be some people thinking if they should. All right, unsupervised learning, right? Unsupervised learning sounds great because we don't need to get our, uh, our, our labels, we just bung in the data, right? But for a lot of these problems that we use it for, dimensionality reduction and cluster analysis, um, we need to be careful, right? Still, for the whole time I've been doing data analysis, if you don't know how many clusters should be in your data, getting an algorithm to tell you convincingly is still really hard, right? So people, that's the most common thing people ask me is they say, can you cluster my data? And I say, how many clusters are in your data? And I'm like, I don't know, there might not be any. And then, uh, right? So if you've got a good hypothesis, I think there should be four patient groups, there should be four cell types, you know, then we can, we've got somewhere. But if you're like, I don't know, and I really don't know, it could be anywhere from one to a thousand, we're in a terrible, terrible uh, position. And these, these manifold learning techniques, these T-SNEs, these UMAPs, whatever they are, you can't look at the picture that you produce and kind of infer too much about it. You can't say, well, look, that cluster's over there, and that cluster's way over there. These must be really different. For instance, that's a real common mistake. You can't do that, right? 
Um, all right, so how do I actually do it? So this is just, I'm just gonna quickly go through this, right? For anybody who actually knows how to write a little bit of code, because I just wanna get across, it's not that hard, right? The hardest bit, it's just like if you're doing statistical analysis, the hardest bit is uh, just getting the data. Now, thankfully, because I'm using this hand-drawn digit, I just have this, right? But if you've got real data from real stuff, this is the bit that's gonna take you 10 times longer than anything else. We've got to normalize the data, which means that every single um, input occupies the same kind of range, right? So you can't have, you know, if you had, if you were trying to predict house prices and you had the number of bathrooms and the square footage, that's going to cause a problem because the square footage is going to go up to 100,000 and the number of bathrooms might go up to three or 10 or wherever you are, but you know what I mean? Massive order of um, magnitude difference. You've got to squash them all down so they take up the same order of magnitude, um, which is what I'm doing there. Then we need to make sure that that one comes in in the right shape, which is what we do there. I matches the input um, layer. And then we, we just have to convert the data to categorical data if we're trying to do uh, categorize the data. And what that means is we convert the number one in our MNIST numerals. Instead of one, we convert it to a binary sort of string where one is occupies this, if it was a zero, we have a one there, if it was a two, we have one there, if it was a three, we have one there, and if it was a nine, we have one there, right? And we have to do this, because if we left it as a one, the network predicted two versus it predicted a nine, the network would be told, you've done an okay job, a two is closer to one than a nine. But as far as categorizing goes, they're both terrible, right? Those are both just as bad if you predict a two or a nine. So by doing this, We've, in, we've informed the network of this. Then we basically build the model. So we say we're going to have an input layer there. We're going to have a dense layer, a fully connected layer like the ones I showed uh, with 64 neurons. We're going to activate it with our logistic function. Then we're going to have another layer, our output layer, which is going to have 10 neurons matching the number of categories. Uh, we use a different activation function, which is just a little trick so that we get a probabilistic interpretation. Uh, so that's our model build. We then say um, to the to the language, can you actually just, can you make that for us? And it says, yeah. Uh, and then we say, all right, now, now that you've made it, can you actually do some maths, which is basically this function? And it goes, yeah, sure, I'll do that maths for you. And then all it's left to do is just fit it. We say, here's the training data, right? When you're done training, can you check how the model performs with this unseen testing data? And you can, can you go through the data three times? And you're done. But it's not actually um, hugely difficult uh, most of the time. So I just want to quickly, before we wrap things up, just talk about what I am actually doing in my lab. So I've got a, a project with, with Jack Audi about identifying microplastics um, in samples. Microplastics are kind of interesting because you can't really use an antibody to label nylon, you know, you can't use a dye to separate the, you know, sterine from polypropylene, right? It's kind of a thorny problem. Um, and so we're looking at basically just how the unlabeled samples fluoresce to a wide range of light sources and hoping that we can uh, identify sort of uh, fingerprints from, from that. The one that I'm spending my personal time the most on is how complex is the math that a biological neuron performs, right? So if you're a neuroscientist, you know that dendrites are sort of non-linear things. They sum up their inputs each one, and then they kind of transfer that to another dendrite, and maybe little dendrites transfer to bigger dendrites, and then to, you know, it's not just output if 10 synapses are active and no output if not, right? And so there's been a lot of sort of debate about exactly what's going on. And so I'm trying to use neural networks to basically mimic that behavior. And if the network needs to be very complicated, then the maths that the neuron is doing must be very complicated. Uh, and one that I'm hoping somebody in here might be interested in working with me on, I have done nothing on this at all, um, is can we identify the risk of uh, a patient's fall from videos of them? Right, so there's been a lot of work on patients wearing wearable sensors, inertial trackers, you know, and they walk around, they put on their suits, they walk around, and we know that from that data, we can predict um, if they're going to fall. But the sort of clinical, well, there's many clinical problems with this, but, um, you know, you get a 90-year-old Parkinsonian to wear a massive suit with a two kgs of cables running off the back. It's not clinically uh, tractable. So basically, and I, I know there are people using this 
uh, in the building, we I want to use deep land cut, which basically produces data like this that looks suspiciously like rain, but I assure you it's not, um, where we can basically track their movements and then the, the, the movements can then be fed into a bigger neural network that can look at those and try and predict. Is this the movement of somebody who will fall or not? And, you know, I'd like to imagine a clinician basically just being able to point their phone at a patient and say, can you walk up and down with me? And it'll say, look, you know, there's a 90% chance this person's going to have a fall in the next month. You should probably do something about it. Um, but obviously, you've heard my caveats. We need lots of videos of people uh, in order to, to perform this. Uh, and so that is the end of my talk. Uh, any questions? Thanks very much, Bill, for that amazing whirlwind tour of all things machine learning and neural networks. I found it fascinating personally. Um, as always, we would love it if students could start off with a question. So are there any students in the room or online who have a burning question? There's got to be lots of questions after all that, surely. I'm going to go through this stunned silence. It's got one question on here, but no student questions. So somebody asked, when in the when when we're performing training, do you expect to see the same results? Oh, okay. Yeah. So so yeah, when you train on the same data over and over again, which is really common, right? You might think you can't make it look at the same data and over and over again, because there is actually this, this phenomenon called overtraining, where basically the, the, the model, instead of learning these generalizable features, which are the features that may exist in any example, they only learn the features that exist in the training example. So you could imagine, you know, um, kind of like how a magician could mark a card in order to be like, ah, oh, you've got the, you know, the ace of spades. The, the, the network doesn't learn the shape of the nine to predict the nine. It knows that in that example, there's a little smudge in that corner. And so if it sees the smudge, it's going to predict the nine. And by using tricks like that, it can achieve perfect performance. But of course, then when it sees new, new data, when none of the nines have smudges in the top corner, it has no idea what's going on. And so theoretically, if you train data over and over again on the training data, especially if that training data is small, and especially if you've made your model very big, the, the model takes the easy way out and just remembers it fundamentally. And so when you then show new data, it has no idea what's going on. And so when you show it a data, a lot of times that's a risk, but generally speaking, so long as you've got enough data and your model's not massively over complex, when you just show it the same one over and over and over again, it just gets better and better. It's, its output gets closer and closer to the label. Oh, wait for other questions. I might actually ask a question, Bill. So you did talk about the, the hidden networks in your in the neural network bit and how you can sort of look under the hood and see what's going on there. Is there actually anything, anything you can learn about the system from those hidden networks? Or is that yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, so you may or may not, and I, it's one of these things like, you know, but anyway, Google had this deep dream thing where you put in photos and you get all these trippy pictures out. That was generated by looking basically in the middle layers of a bigger network um, and it was just the result of 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 the basically the input times coefficients and that's what you saw fundamentally um, and so what i mean on the other hand there is a problem right and these big neural networks we kind of do have no idea how they work right and and um, that that so we can look at the weights that is those coefficients um, and we can see their values, but often it can be completely mysterious how they achieve anything. But on the other hand, if you think about what you're doing and you, from the outset, design your model to be interpretable, you can take things away from it. So, for instance, I, I've got a student and we're looking at RNA seq data sets of, you know, she keeps telling me off called RNA seq, the RNA array data sets um, <coughs> of, of tumors and how uh, the survival times, right? Now we could have just made it any arbitrary model, bung them in and we'd be completely, uh, we might be able to really predict somebody's survival time, but we'd have no idea how. But by designing the model carefully, we can look at the coefficients and basically say, these are the genes that are important for predicting a long survival time. These are the genes that are important for predicting a small survival time. And it's combinations of these two that allow us to form our prediction. 
Okay, well, it's questions everywhere now. Uh, Kath? Hi, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, more and more, maybe it's one of the media, I'm not sure, but um, this, we have a big collections of data that have got you know variables, lots of variables on, and sometimes a small number of people. And we do all the linear regression and linked regression, and we find often nothing, probably because I'm a coward, always nothing that I can make a choice. And then people say, oh, well, I'll do machine learning, that'll get a point where that can see. What do you think about that sort of approach? I mean, I, I what do I think about that approach? Um, well, yeah, like that, that is a that is an approach, all right. But like, um, yeah, I mean, machine learning, you know, machine learning falls into all of the same traps that statisticians have known exist in simpler things, right? And and um, you know, so you know, what 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 a statistician calls shrinkage, a machine learning person. We'll just call. We'll call it. Uh, 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 what do they call it right now? But anyway, the point is the same. All the same problems remain. Um, and and uh, so you could form a very good prediction. The problem is you're valid if you've got a tiny sample of ten people, but with a thousand genes. And yeah, you might be able to say I can predict very well on these two people that I didn't put in my training set. But who cares, right? Because those. So it's such a small sample that you don't really know if you had a million people how it would behave. Um, and, you know, overfitting, forming violently complicated networks that just remember every single example is super easy to do. Um, I've done it accidentally just the other day. So, yeah, you, you hate to be in that situation, but sometimes there can be sense drawn from it, right? Just in the same way that, you know, fitting a linear regression versus a logistic regression can make a big difference. It's the same kind of thing, but if you think about it carefully and cautiously and are aware of the pitfalls, sometimes it can be useful, but you know, you need to be careful. Just, I mean, as it says there, well, it said there, right? It's, 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 it's statistics under it all. Um, and so it's got all the same problems. And so the power considerations are similar to standard statistics or? We'll see this because we're not we're not well. They are they are. What can I say to that? Um, I'm just you know thinking of when I read a grant and it says you know I want to do machine learning and I have to worry about power. Really? Yeah, <laughs> it's power is a way. It is. Yeah, it's because what we would classically do is you would say, you know, if we're talking about that as supervised learning problems, you would say, here's your training set, here's your validation set, and our, um, and if we can predict in the validation set that the, data, the training data's never seen before, then we're done, right? Um, and there's a certain ineffable logic that's hard to deny in that, but it, it is not necessarily true because if your, none of your data, because it's so small, covers the whole, distribution of all of the potential values, then you're not really fitting a complex model. You're not really fitting it on the population, you're fitting it on the sample. And yeah, so, you know, if somebody says, look, I got a hundred people and I fit a model and I did it behave really well, you know, give me some money so I can get, <laughs> I can increase that sample size by a hundred, I would listen to them. Yeah. If they said I've done this well on a hundred people and it worked really well, so I'm done, then I wouldn't listen to them. Yeah, James. Yeah, it was great. And he won't have time to check out his website as well. It's really very small mm -hmm. and um, With the catastrophic forgetting mm -hmm. example, so. Which was just for fun, right? Yeah, I want to just stress that. I just wanted to give, make an oh, example. There's a question okay. to chat about. Oh, okay. okay. So, so really, so if we're looking at, say, uh, children that are growing up in bilingual households, yep. where it, can take them longer to learn both languages, but at the end of it, they have both languages. Yeah. What would happen in that example if you presented and they tried to learn the numbers and the fashion? Yeah, at the same time. Um, what I predict would happen is that in the small model, the final uh, accuracy would be low. Yeah, in like, I don't know, something like 70 percent because right? it just doesn't have the capacity in it. I just doesn't have enough coefficients in it to learn all of the details of both. 
because it's essentially 20 problems instead of 10. But in the large one, I'm absolutely confident it would learn it would learn that easily. And in part of this, I mean, humans and animals in general very rarely operate on 100% accuracy mm -hmm. required. So there's obviously a level where your model is sufficient yeah. for the for the task that yeah. required. Yeah. yeah, and and so that that's because with this that the, I never use the phrase gradient descent, but that iterative process where it learns the weights and then sees its error and gets slightly better. That goes on forever. It never stops, right? Because it can never reach the bottom. So there's always that thing where you need to say, is this good enough? Um, because it, you can just leave it running for days and days and days and days, and every single day it'll make a 0.0001 percent improvement. And does that matter? So yeah, it's always something. If you're able to make that decision. No. No, it, it just keeps going. It just keeps, I mean, you can tell it oh, when you get to 90% accuracy, stop, right? right? But then you're always going to go, but if I miss a bit longer, we've got 91. And, you know, so I don't, and so that's actually why a lot of people will have a, a training and testing and a validation data set so that they'll do the this training on the training set, tell you how good it is on this, this other holdout set, and you'll keep going and going and going. And then when you think you're done, you have to go, all right, I'm done. And then you show it the data never, ever, ever seen before, and you'll only ever show it once. And then that is your final performance where you just, you say, I'm done, I'm done, and you know, and you cross your finger. And I mean, it's one of those things, it's like pee hacking, right? That how many times do people truly do that and then go, well, that turned out terrible. All right, we're doing it, we're stuck again. Anyway, but yeah. The one question over here may well be the last one, depending on how we go. All right, I've got a question about um, using the neural networks to really come up with that. Neuron. Okay, go. Yeah, because that was actually the most interesting. Thing. Yep. Um, so I'm wondering how many of that you think with that? You said about there, right? Think of distance and stuff like that. Yep. And you also got things like synaptic scaling or the amount of like your own variability. Yep. And then I was also wondering how do you train a neural classifier to recognize signals that are different? Because it seems like all the inputs that you're giving out are like you're saying these are important that I need to learn off them. What if you have a coincidental uh, signal coming from other population neurons onto a neuron that aren't important at that time? Is there a way that you can use a neural network to classify against that? Yes, absolutely. So, catastrophic failure. Um, so, so <laughs> again, this is machine learning being statistics, right? So they have a collection of techniques called bridge. I'm just saying, yeah, I'm calling you a statistician. I'm not even sure, but anyway, so you're my statistician now. That they have, they have these things called lasso regression and ridge regression that basically are mechanisms for trying to say, does that actually matter or not? Because you know, just like. In linear regression, if you add on a completely random noise, your R squared will always go down a little bit. It's just the same in a neural network. If you give it a completely irrelevant data set, it will always go, well, actually, I can use that data set to, to just help me predict on this one example that I wasn't quite getting because it goes high just when that one comes up, right? So if you leave it alone, it will go, yeah, I need that one. Give it, let me have it, right? Um, but there are ways where you can say, do you really need it? Because if you start to um, listen to things that you don't really need, I'm going to start punishing you for listening to too many things. I want you to listen to less things. And so there are a lot, it's pretty advanced area of basically saying only listen to things that you really need and ignore anything you don't need. So that bit, we're on top of that. Does that have anything to do with catastrophic forgetting? Um, that is a fine question. So actually, how I enforced it to learn the sparse representation is basically exactly like what I've been talking about to say, don't listen to things you don't need. In fact, listen to as little as possible. Um, but more generally, I would say that I have no idea. That's what I would say right now. <laughs> okay, quick follow up to that. I was just wondering, it's still a sleep after you your daughter. Um, with the adult, the, the, yeah. Is there a way to create populations of these neurons in your neural network? So when it gets like random signals, it goes, I actually I know that this is to do with fashion, not to do with numbers, because of the way I've reconstructed it, and then they just swap free. So how do you predict neural networks in the actual way? That's a good question. Um, I mean, that that strikes me as the kind of thing that 
you might be able to show was occurring in some particular instantiation, some particular version of some particular architecture that you kind of hand wired to make it do that. Now I can imagine training a network first in some simplified version so that all it, it, it has to do is, is this from the numeral data set or is this from the fashion data set? I bet you'd be able to do that really easily. And then on top of that, you build a network that tries to form the prediction and it could use that information to help it swap and that's possible. But I think it's more likely that it's gonna go, uh, bugger that weird neuron i'm going to do my own thing and kind of throw the information away which i've because I've, I've done this pre-training technique to try and encourage interpretability like a hundred times and i'm always like this time it's going to work and the network always goes no nah, bugger your pre-training i'm going to go to where i'm going to go and again it's that kind of gradient descent thing that you've got this big bowl in the cost function where it's going to walk downhill and yeah there might be a little divot off to the right where you retain lovely interpretable function but it sees that and goes yeah but there's a big hole down there i'm going to go i'm going to minimize this cost function and i don't care about being interpretable so you really have to be very heavy-handed with models if you want to encourage them to stay in some sensible form like that where you've got this neuron that goes i'm fashion you know and i mean i can think of ways of doing it but yeah it will probably end up with worse performance than if we just let it rip. Thank you so much, Bill. Absolutely wonderful talk. And yeah, I'm doing this because I want collaborators, right? So if we've got big data, you know, annoying data, come and talk to me. I'm trying to sell myself, exactly. Thanks, Bill.